Love is uh, commitment. Love is caring and kind. Love is two people who are committed to each other that are willing to do anything for each other. First thing that comes to mind is selfless. I just think that love is a choice. That it's communication. Doing something nice for somebody. When two people have an emotional connection. Love is Jesus. I think love is finding someone who completes you and makes you feel whole. What is love? Love tastes like mom's mac and cheese. I think love is a choice. It's a decision you make. I think love is spending time with family and friends. Well, love's definitely not a feeling because it is, but it's, it's not. It's more than that. Friendship. Love is waking up next to your best friend and pancakes on Saturday mornings. And then thirdly, a comedy. Uh, pumpkin spice latte. Different relationships with people and it, like she said, it's not a feeling. Love is a gift from God. Love is a four letter word spelled J-O-H-N. Okay, that was just a little bit of fun, but we wanted to kind of introduce it that way because this week it's a one-off as we are taking a break from our story. We finished up the Old Testament. We're starting the New Testament next week, and we're really excited as we will be moving into that. But this week we thought, Valentine's weekend, why don't we talk about love? Um, you know, as we think about the idea of love for marriage... I want us to understand that it's always worthwhile taking a pause and talking about that for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, from a Christian point of view, marriage was God's idea. I can't help but think that God was at the very first marriage when he brought Adam and Eve together and, and you know, there was that glorious union at that time. And God honored marriage as one of the fundamental institutions of our human society. We recognize it's also a human institution with all of the cultural aspects uh, to marriage. It looks different around different parts of the world, but, but still, that fundamental desire to say, you know, this is one of the key institutions of what makes up human existence. You know, the second thing, though, too, that it's worthwhile always to take a pause every once in a while and have a message or do a series on marriage is because it's something that is glorious and hard all at the same time. And it's important that we don't do what I call a drift into a cynicism around marriage today where you say, oh my goodness, marriage is, you know, all the excitement is all in the dating and the courtship, but once you get married, it just gets boring and hard. We got to get a glorious vision for marriage. At the same time, though, we have to be really honest and transparent about the challenges of marriage because it's not easy. Um, and we have, to, we have to grasp that. Now, again, I want to say hello to all those who are watching this via our YouTube channel, and especially to Ty and Amanda, who are watching us at the Lab West uh, Journey Home Church up in Labrador City. So hi, Ty and Amanda, and all those who are gathered with you. You know, as we are taking a moment here and looking at the idea of marriage, I want to again say to those of you who aren't married yet, this is still worth paying attention to because likely that will be your journey somewhere down the road for you. And for those of you who are married right now, we want to, hopefully this will be an encouragement to you. And for those of you who may be considering stepping back into the marriage world, well, here's something again to reflect on. Now, again, if you have your outline with you, I want to um, simply say there's so many things we could do to describe what marriage is. I, I can't help but think when I listen to all of those songs uh, in this uh, love song quiz, what you were hearing were a lot of different definitions of what marriage is all about. And I get that. And in one way, we, as, you, as you want to read in your outline there, we all sometimes want a simple answer to the grand question of love you know, you know, what is, what is love and what is, you know, married love all about? 
However, we got to understand that love is so deep and mysterious that it does defy a simple definition. And that's why the song industry is never going to run out of new songs to sing about, about love. Yet, what I want you to consider this weekend as we ask this question, do you know what love is? I want you to consider this. Wherever you find love, wherever you find love, you will also find forgiveness. Wherever you find love, you will also find forgiveness. In fact, I want to present to you this idea that the secret ingredient to a love-filled marriage is learning to forgive. If you really want a love-filled marriage, it's learning to forgive. I, I, I think of the passage tonight that we just want you to commit to memory and that is in found in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. And if we could bring that up, let's read it together. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. And, and in fact, the part I just really want you to focus in on is that last phrase. Let's, so let's read that. Just start at for love, okay? So for love covers a multitude of sins. Wow. You know, Ruth Graham, the, the late Ruth Graham, uh, the wife of Billy Graham, said this, a happy marriage is the union of two good forgivers. A happy marriage is the union of two good forgivers. You know, when we think about why is forgiveness, what we're saying, the secret ingredient to a love-filled marriage? Why? Well, let's talk about the need for forgiveness in our marriages. Um, you know, there's first of all just the disappointments that we're going to have with each other when it comes to marriage. I mean, we might, we sometimes I find when we're newly married, and I especially want to speak to young couples at this moment, is that you sort of come in with all your hopes and dreams and aspirations of saying, oh, this is what we're going to achieve. This is what we're going to do. And you have all of these sort of just these great desires. And then all of a sudden, something happens. You know, one spouse doesn't, um, you know, get that job that you were really banking on. Um, the other spouse um, gets too stressed out with that move that you just have to make if you're going to achieve the, your next goals. Um, someone gets sick. Someone gets um, nervous. Uh, someone else uh, gets overwhelmed. And on and on the list goes. Someone spends too much money so you can't get the home that you were planning to get. And on and on the list goes. And there's disappointments with each other in your marriage. And, and what do you do with those disappointments? And obviously, too, we know that those disappointments can go even deeper there can be betrayals, there can be lies, there can be, you know, you're, you're hiding stuff from each other, but ultimately there's just disappointment. What do you do with that? How do you get through that? Um, and then you move from disappointments to disagreements. And the thing about disagreements sometimes is that you both have a good point. We're going to my mother's for Christmas Day. No, I have to go to my mother's for Christmas Day or it will not be good for me for months to come. You don't understand. We went to your mother's last Christmas. We have to go to your mother's this Christmas. On and on it goes. How do you deal with legitimate, worthy goals that clash with one another? I want to sleep in. I'm tired. I want to get up. We said we were going to paint the room. Um, you know, we're going to take a trip in the summer. And we're going to go on a big excursion across Canada. No, we're not. I'm going to get a lazy boy. And I'm going to park it in the backyard. And I'm going to lay out there for the next three weeks. I mean, on and on it goes. You know, as we think about disagreements, we can sometimes laugh about what the disagreements may be. But again, the disagreements can be zeroed around money, around sexual expectations, um, can be centered around our relationships to our family. Some people want really close relationships with the family. Others want a little more distance. 
Um, the disagreements at times, too, is this. Sometimes if one of the partners is going to achieve their goal, it often means the other partner has to be willing to say, okay, I'm going to set mine aside because we really can't do them all at the same time. Life sometimes just doesn't allow that. I mean, maybe the disagreement is how many children you're going to have in your family. One comes from a large family, and they want six or seven children. Whoa. Others come from a single family. What do you do? It's disagreements. I mean, what happens if you're also, what about your faith? One person wants to really get in, be involved in the church community. The other person's like, ah, oh, you know what? I'm, that's just, I'm not in that mo f mindset right now. What do you do with disagreements? Ultimately, though, the need for forgiveness really boils down to our depravity. Um, Tim Keller makes a point in his book, The Meaning of Marriage, Facing the Complexities of Commitment with the Wisdom of God, and he says this. Now listen. Any two people who enter into marriage are spiritually broken by sin, which among other things means to be self-centered. They're, excuse me, living life curved in on themselves. And as author Dennis de Rougemont says, why should neurotic, selfish, immature people suddenly become angels when they fall in love? Keller goes on to say, that is why good marriage is more painfully hard to achieve than artistic or athletic prowess. Raw natural talent does not enable you to play baseball as a pro or write great literature without enduring discipline and enormous amount of work. Why would it be easy to live lovingly and well with another human being in light of what is profoundly wrong within our human nature? Indeed, many people who've mastered athletics and the arts have failed miserably at marriage. So the biblical doctrine of sin explains why marriage, more than anything else that is good and important in this fallen world, is so painful and so hard. We're turned in on ourselves. We struggle with our brokenness. And that brokenness leaks out all over the place in the most intimate relationship between a man and a woman in marriage. So there's the need for forgiveness, disagreements, disappointments, but most of our depravity. Well, that leads us to the second issue around why forgiveness is the secret ingredient, and that is we have, though, this what I call this fear of forgiveness. We need it, but we're afraid of it. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. You see, I think the one thing marriage offers all of us is one of the most deepest needs that we desire in the way God has made us. God created us to be in relationship with one another and with him. And yet we know that in the story of the fall, that when Adam and Eve sinned, what did they go and do? They went and hid. They, yeah, they, they, they hide. They hid. They, 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 they ran away from God. And we have to understand that ever since the fall, even because we're made in God's image, we still have this profound desire to be known. We really do want to be known. Yet we also are terrified of being known because if we're known, then you're going to know all about my brokenness. You're going to see all the bad parts of me too. So I don't want you to see those bad parts, so I build walls around me, and you build walls around you, and we're all walled in with each other, and we're in trouble. But now here's the thing. It's one thing to have walls up between ourselves at a church or neighbors or even with our family, but now we enter into a marriage union, and we want those walls to come down. Now, here's the wonderful thing. People will tell you, and often when they're courting, that, that, that real positive side of being known is so wonderful because, let's be honest, you're putting your best foot forward. You know, he's coming over at 7 o'clock, and you have yourself all smelling really good, and your hair's looking beautiful, and the makeup's on, and, and of course, he's spraying axe all over himself in the car and and you know everything's good and everyone's got their best foot forward and and of course you you want it you want to hear everything about her and what she is interested in and what she values and what's her favorite 
book and her favorite treat and her favorite flower and her favorite place to go to, and you're just breathless to hear about it. And she is too, right? It's, 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 it's a mutual thing. And, and of course, in that very positive time of being known, you know, people are feeling heard. I mean, isn't it wonderful when you really feel like someone's hearing you? Doesn't that feel good? I mean, which is easier to do, listen or talk? As an extrovert, I can tell you, talking is a lot easier. <laughs> it's like cotton candy. <laughs> Listening is like doing the squats. It's like running a marathon. <laughs> oh, my goodness, i got to listen to them talk again. No, I mean, no, it, it, to listen is really an act of love, right? It really is, to really listen. But can you imagine you're being listened to, you're being heard, and, and you're, being, you're being valued, and... and and you're being understood, and you're going, oh, oh, this is such a safe place to be. This is so wonderful. I know this is the soulmate of my life. And then you start listening to all these love songs, and you're playing them at night, and you're, yes, you know. But, but you see, here's the, the shadow side of being known. There's a negative side. Because if I'm really going to be known, I have to let you know what are my deepest fears, my deepest place of brokenness. I can't hide from you. And so if I do that, that means now I'm vulnerable. That means now you know which buttons to push on me that can hurt me. That now when you criticize me, you can criticize me with just that little bit of a twist to it. <laughs> right? You're just like your, <laughs> okay, someone just yelled out, just like your mother. <laughs> but, but the point is, there. <laughs> okay, we may have to do some counseling after this message, but the point is, um, that's, but, that's, but that's the reality. But that's the reality, right? That, that all of a sudden you're vulnerable because you're known. And your traits that maybe do come from your family are now exposed. And that person has the ability, if, if they're not careful, to take that knowledge of knowing you and use it in a way to condemn you and to break you and to make you feel horrible. And so, so, so and, and here's the reality. If I'm going to need, if I need to ask for your forgiveness in, my, in the marriage... It means that I have to know that you know my bad side, that you see my weakness, you see my sin, you know that I'm curved in, you knew I was being selfish, you knew I was being angry, you knew I was being struggling with whatever, and, and I have to go and ask for forgiveness, but it means now I'm known. There's no more pretense. I can't pretend I'm the big guy on campus. I can't pretend that I, I got my act all together. And even when I walk into another room and I try to pretend I've got it all together, there's my spouse, and she knows. It's kind of humbling, isn't it? It's kind of vulnerable. And a lot of us struggle with this whole idea of being known in our marriage. But this is where we need to go. But the only way we can get there of being known is we've got to go through the path of forgiveness. But here's the thing, though, that's so tough about this being known, is that now that we know the truth about each other, um, I, I want to really just highlight this to you. Uh, th this is an observation, again, by Keller from his book on the meaning of marriage, but he says this, in the fallen world, marriage's power of truth and the power of love can come to loggerheads. Now listen carefully. When we are first sinned against by our spouses in a serious way, that is when we bring out the power of truth. We tell our spouses what fools, what messes, what selfish pigs they are. And the first few times we do it, however, we learn to our surprise how shattering our criticism can be. Sometimes we let some... Uh, fly some real harsh, insulting remarks, and the next thing we know, there's nothing left of our spouses but a pair of sneakers with smoke coming out of them. What happened? What happened with that power of truth? I mean, isn't the truth supposed to set us free? Well, Keller makes this observation. He says, because of our spousal power of love, the statement of truth doesn't help. It destroys. 
And when we see how devastating truth-telling can be in our marriage, it then pushes us to the opposite error. We may then decide that our job is just to affirm and we avoid telling our spouses how disappointed we are or how hurt we are, so we just shut up and we stuff and we hide what we really think and we feel and we exercise the power of love but not the power of truth. And the moment we do that, the potential of marriage, which is a great place of growth for us to continue to grow up and be what God wants us to be, is lost because no, we have love, but we have no truth. And the opportunity to grow is lost. And we end up, as it says here in the outline, we end up hiding in plain sight from each other. It's like, don't talk to... Don't talk to Dave about that. You can talk to him about everything else, but we all don't talk about that. And well, don't talk to so-and-so about that because we all know when we bring that up, it's going to be curtains for everybody. So we end up hiding, and we don't know what to do with truth. So here's the great problem. Spouses either stay away from the truth, they bounce off each other, or they attack one another with the truth, and they shatter their marriage. So the question becomes, how do we show love and truth together? How do we do that? Well, that brings us to the third thing about forgiveness. So we have the need for forgiveness. We have the fear of forgiveness because it's about being known. But here's the thing. The way of forgiveness is through the covering of grace. How do we live out grace in our marriage? Now again, the biblical definition of grace or a theological definition of grace is that grace is undeserved favor. It's unmerited love. God loves me not because I obeyed him enough. God loves me unconditionally. When you see Jesus dying on the cross for you, forgiving you, putting away your sin, that changes everything. I mean, God saw your heart to the bottom, but he loved you to the skies. And the joy and freedom that comes from knowing that the Son of God did that for you now now enables you to do the same for your spouse. Now, I want to read that line one more time because that's so critical when we talk about a Christian understanding and approach to marriage. The joy and freedom that comes from knowing that what the Son of God did for you, he gave his all for you, he died for you, he made you right before God, he loved you before you loved him or even knew him now enables you to do that same thing for your spouse. You see, now you can approach your marriage with love and truth with an emotional humility. There's no longer sense a, a sense of superiority. There's no sense of walking into your marriage and going, well, I'm so good and you're so, you know, messed up. No. All of us have sinned. All of us are broken And there's this joyful confidence. I no longer have to please everyone to be accepted. God accepts me because that's the power of grace. So I come into my marriage not looking for my spouse acceptance because I already know that I'm accepted by God. But I want now to say, let's continue to grow in love together. You know, through embracing God's grace, we can start to learn the skill to tell the straight, unvarnished truth about what each of us had done to one another And then completely and unself-righteously and joyously express forgiveness without a shred of superiority, without ever making the other person feel small. Now, this does not mean you cannot express anger. In fact, you can never, you, if you never express anger, your truth-telling probably won't sink in. But forgiving grace must always be present. And if it is, it will, like salt in the meat, keep the anger from going bad. Then truth and love can live together because beneath them both you have forgiven your spouse as Christ has forgiven you. You know what that really means? That means you you don't ever play fair with each other. You don't play fair. You don't you don't sit there and keep a score with each other and say, "Well, well you did this last week, so I'm allowed to do this to you this week." Or, I remember what you did to me last Christmas, so boy, oh boy, you're getting it this Christmas. I'm keeping a calendar. No, you don't play fair at all. Because you realize that God didn't play fair with you. 
He showed you grace. And that's how you're not going to play fair with your spouse. You're always going to show them grace. In which then love and truth can be expressed. Um, I read this story before, but I like to read it again. It is said that one of the old uh, sires of Russia had a trusted general who was dying of his wounds. And when the soldier was on his deathbed, the Tsar promised to raise the soldier's young son and provide for him. And after his death, the Tsar made good on his word. He gave the young boy the best of places to live and the best education. He was given a commission. He entered the army. However, the young man had an addiction to gambling. And because he couldn't cover his gambling debts, he began to embezzle from the regiment's funds. And one night he was sitting in the tent looking at the books and he realized his embezzlement was about to be discovered. And he could hide it no longer from the accountants. He sat drinking heavily as he prepared to kill himself. He had the revolver by his side and he took a few more drinks to strengthen his resolve for the suicide. But the drink was so potent, he passed out on the table. The night, that night, Desire was doing what he often did. Disguised as a simple soldier, he was walking through the camp in the ranks trying to assess the morale of his army, hearing what he could hear. He then walked into the tent of his foster son and saw him slumped over the book. And he read the book and he realized what he'd done and what he was about to do. And when the young man awoke hours later, to his surprise, the revolver was gone, and then he saw a letter by his hand, and to his shock, it was a promissory note, and this is what the the note read. I, the Tsar, will pay the full amount from my own personal funds to make up the difference found in this book. And it was sealed with the Tsar's personal seal, and the Tsar had the young man's sin, had seen the young man's sin clearly, The full dimensions of what he had done, but he covered it, and he paid for the sin personally. That's what the Lord of the universe has done for us all in the person of Jesus Christ. And he looked into our hearts, and he saw the worst. And this wasn't some sort of abstract exercise for Jesus Christ. Our sins, remember, put him to death. But when Jesus was up there, Nailed to the cross, he looked down, he saw us, some of us denying him, some of us betraying him, all of us forsaking him. He saw our sin and he covered it. Let's just go to the next point in the outline. It says here, you and I, when we have a deep experience of what Christ has done for us, the very first place that that experience should ripple out to, if we're married, is towards our spouse. If God was willing to cover our sins, we remember this verse, love covers a multitude of sins. What does a good marriage made up of? Two good forgivers. If you're married, Don't worry, you'll be able to practice forgiving probably really soon, probably before the night's over. If you're not married, here's the neat thing. You get to practice forgiving with everybody else you rub shoulders with. It gets you ready for your marriage. Let's pray. Lord, as we think about what you've done for us in Christ, Lord, make us mindful that just as Jesus laid down his life for us, forgiving us at a great cost to make us something beautiful. And Lord, help us to see because Christ has done that for us, that in him we can do the same for others. Lord, I I, I can't help but think how our sins hurt Jesus infinitely more than our spouse's sins has hurt me. Or you or us. But Lord, I just want to pray that, that you would give us the love of Christ. And Lord, that would be expressed as we forgive one another. And as we then seek to learn to love each other more, both in truth and with hope. And we pray this in Christ's name.